So today we are going to take a laughter break for the health of it uh, in celebration of Wellbeing in Law Week. I'm going to take you through a little bit of uh, preparation to get you ready for uh, Joey. And uh, let's start this with a little meditation. Um, there's a lot of talk about meditation these days. Some of you may have active meditation practices. Some of you may have tried it. And some of you maybe aren't quite getting it. For this meditation, there are only three things you need to think about. What day is today? What day of the week? What is today's date? And where are you right this minute? And I don't mean where are you in your career? I mean, where are you physically? Where are your feet planted right this minute? I will ask you these questions and you should answer them aloud, but I will not give you the answers. So first, if you'd like to close your eyes, make sure your feet are planted firmly on the floor and your hands are located comfortably uh, on your armchair or in your desk in front of you. And as is typical with a meditation, we're gonna take three cleansing breaths. So let's breathe in through our mouth, in through our nose, sorry. And out through our mouth. And again, breathe in through your nose. and out through your mouth. And one more breath in through your nose. And out through your mouth. I know that most of us are currently living in either the past where we were this morning or the future, what we need to do this afternoon. But for the best benefit of laughter for your health and well being, we need to be present in the moment. So answer these three questions out loud. What day of the week is today? Today is... What is today's date? Today's date is... And where are you this moment? I am in... Now let's take a deep breath in, blow it out, and let's repeat one more time. What day is today? Today is, what is today's date? Today's date is, And where are you right now? I am in. Let's take a deep breath in. Blow it out. We now have centered ourselves in space and time. We are aware of where we are seated and what we are about to do. We are being present in the moment. Take one more breath in, blow it out, and open your eyes. And hopefully that has helped you clear your mind a little bit of all those things you Cynthia. may have Matakey. Join the meeting. Hi, Cynthia. <laughs> All right. So laughter is a very special thing in our lives because it not only helps our well-being, 
It helps our wellness. And what do we mean by that? The definition of wellness as uh, described by the National Institute of Health is a, a state of being that has several dimensions, including emotional, coping effectively with life, and the physical, recognizing the need for activity, diet, healthy foods, and sleep. We might think that wellness is the only thing we need to pay attention to because it appears like well-being things are somehow in there in that definition. However, most recently, some of you may have been offered a wellness program by your employer or by a fraternal group or a community. And very often that involves exercising, getting weighed, getting your blood pressure taken and your cholesterol measured. Most often it does not touch on your well being or mental health side. And we, the CDC, defines well being as the presence of positive emotions and moods, including contentment and happiness, the absence of negative emotions, such as depression and anxiety, and most important, satisfaction with life, fulfillment, and positive functioning. The truth is that some of us do not have wellness on a daily basis. We may have autoimmune disorder or chronic uh, health condition. We may have physical challenges that affect our wellness. Well-being, however, you can have all the time. So in other words, you can have well-being without wellness, but having well-being will help improve your wellness. So I hope that helps a little bit to, do, to understand the distinction between the two. The good news is that laughter benefits both sides of this equation. And here from the Mayo Clinic, I'm gonna very quickly go over both the physical and psychological benefits of laughter. Laughter enhances your intake of oxygen, stimulates your heart, lungs, and muscles, and releases endorphins. It can relieve pain. Norman Cousins found that 10 minutes of hearty belly laughing gave him three to four hours of pain-free sleep. Laughter soothes uh, tension, not only in your body, but in your mind. Uh, it improves your mood. I'm gonna ask everyone to please mute themselves so we can um, not have background noise in our recordings. Thank you so much. Um, it improves your mood. It can increase your personal satisfaction and help you cope with difficult situations. And an amazing thing is that it improves your immune system. There have even been some humor practitioners who are studying now whether people who have regular laughter practices in their life were better able to resist COVID-19 exposure. So we're gonna find out some of that. And I belong to the Association for Applied and Therapeutic Humor, which means we are the people who are serious about laughter. So I'm going to give you a little warm up exercise of laughing for the health of it without comedy or jokes. We're gonna leave that up to Joey. And the only things you need to do are breathe. As we were breathing in our meditation, using yogic pranayama breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth, getting that oxygen and endorphins. Laugh. When I ask you to laugh, you may feel weird. Like, how can I laugh? Nothing's funny. The whole idea of laughing for the health of it is to just make the laughter sounds. Ha 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 ha, ho ho ho, he 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 he. If you can turn that into genuine hearty laughter, that's wonderful. But if you cannot, you are going to fool your brain anyway. By just making those sounds and doing the breathing, your brain is gonna say, okay, we were happy about something. Let me just release the endorphins just in case. And we're gonna do a little bit of movements. And that always is helpful for the body. If you're in a full laughter wellness class, you're usually standing in a circle with other people and there's quite a bit of movement. So now you're getting aerobic exercise, you're getting endorphins for your brain, 
physical, psychological, just in laughter. So let's give it a try. You can sit or you can stand. I'll remain seated so you can see me. You're gonna to remember to fake it until you make it. In other words, make laughter sounds until you perhaps can have genuine laughter. You're gonna remember what it was like when you were a kid and just laughed for no reason. In fact, babies laugh before they speak. And when I was a young mother, I was told that was because they had gas. And that's not really, they may have gas, that's, but babies laugh because of this sinking of brain waves between you and a baby when you laugh together. And you would think, of course, I'm the adult. My brain is training the baby. And that's not what it is at all. The baby kind of diabolically is exercising this kind of mind control over your brain waves in order to raise the baby's chances of being taken care of, held, and loved. So laughter really has some powerful things for human survival. When we do these laughter exercises, you moderate what you're doing according to your own health conditions. This isn't the gym. This isn't a no pain, no gain thing. This is just for enjoyment. One of the hardest things to do on Zoom is make eye contact while you're doing this. So as we're doing the exercise, occasionally look into your camera. And while you're not getting eye contact at that second, someone else in our audience will. All right, so I'm gonna push my chair out a little bit and I'm just gonna to demonstrate to you the laughter breathing techniques that we use using the respiratory parts of our body that we hardly ever use. The first laughter sound is ho, ho, ho. And that lives in your diaphragm. We get this whole idea of a belly laugh from that guy who's in the mall every December with the red suit and the reindeer. So I want you to take a breath in and just say ho, 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 as forcefully as you can. Ready, breathe in. Ho, ho, ho. All right. Now, the second laughter sound is ha, and it lives in your lungs, but towards the bottom, another place where we don't often get oxygen. So place your hands at the bottom of your lungs, take a deep breath in and say ha, ha, ha. Ready, breathe in, ha, ha, ha. Now, the third place laughter lives in your body is here, up in your bronchial tubes, where we live most of the day. This is how shallowly we are breathing most of the time. And the laughter sound that goes with it is he, he, he. So take a, a breath in and say that. Breathe in, he, he, he. You can probably feel your throat constricting and the breath only getting down to here. All right, so those three sounds are now used in an exercise in which we will breathe, ho, 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 breathe ha ha ha, breathe he he he. And absolutely the most important part of this exercise is then turning to your camera, raising your hands and doing this. Whee! All right, so ho ho ho, ha ha ha, he he he, we, let's do it. And if you're comfortable, unmute yourself because I'd love to hear you. All right, here we go. Ready, breathe in. Ho, ho, ho. Ha, 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 ha. 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 Ha, ha, all right, if you could uh, get your pulse or even have a Fitbit on, you will notice that that little exercise has raised your pulse <laughs> several beats. Doing this for five or 10 minutes will raise your pulse up into aerobic and sometimes cardiac levels just from laughing. So you're helping your brain release endorphins, you're helping your body get um, oxygenated blood all through it, 
and you're getting a little exercise. And so that's my introduction to laughing for no reason. And now that you've practiced your laughter, I hope to hear you all uh, once uh, Joey starts his presentation. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Joey and I'm really so pleased that he has joined us today. He's been a political comedian, a camp counselor, an editorial director, attorney, busboy, radio show host, professional speaker, child actor, attorney, and elected official in New Jersey, but not necessarily in that order, because I was confused that child actor came so long in this list. So he is a professional stand-up comedian with appearances on MTV, Comedy Central, and Rascal's Comedy Hour. He has appeared at hundreds of comedy clubs across the US and Canada, and opened in concert at comedy clubs for Jerry Seinfeld, Robert Klein, who was the entertainment at my prom, David Brenner, Louis Black, and Paul Reiser. As an improv actor, he's had the privilege of appearing with Robin Williams at the comic strip in New York City and studied with Chicago's famed Second City improvisational theater director and improv guru, Del Close. Uh, he is also an accomplished humor educator and provided humor programs for major Fortune, Fortune 500 corporations, including AT&T, Johnson & Johnson, MetLife, and Merrill Lynch. Joey has been a keynote presenter on humor for the National League of Cities, National Association of County Organizations, and many state leagues of municipalities. His work has been featured in newspapers and uh, magazines and television stations throughout the United States. And he has provided the improvisational lawyer workshops for more than 25 bar associations across the nation and is currently writing an improv training manual uh, for lawyers through uh, trial guides. And with uh, no further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and introduce Joey Novick. If you would like to see him and just him, you can press the speaker choice in view and then you'll have a nice uh, large picture of him. All yours, Joey. Great, thank you. Can we have a hand for Noreen? Thank you, Noreen. I appreciate you very much. So I'm gonna ask you to do two things on Friday afternoon. Number one, please unmute yourself because I wanna hear your voices. I wanna hear you yelling at your husband or wife in the background. I wanna hear the dogs. I wanna hear everybody. Please unmute yourself, okay? So I really wanna hear you. So if you can all unmute yourself. I, I hate those little lines through the little microphone there, unmute yourself. And the second thing I'm gonna ask you to do, as long as you're wearing clothes, is please un, uh, you know, let me see what you look like. Okay, let me see some faces because I see some beautiful pictures. I see some beautiful, you know, uh, names. I want to I want to put a name with the face. So if you put your face on so I can see you at the same time, I see the brave people are coming on. The rest of you, I hope, uh, get to join us. So I am uh, Joey Novick. I am an attorney. I'm a comedian. Um, I, you know, whenever anybody reads all my background, I just get completely exhausted. So. For me here today, I'm just here uh, with you. You're here with me. We're going to have a little fun. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the improvisational lawyer. Um, and I always like to begin with a story because I like to tell you a little bit about myself. So <laughs> the baseball season just started. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you back to 1962. Uh, summer of 1962, my dad came home uh, one evening about maybe um, one o'clock or two o'clock early in the afternoon. And he said to me words that any one world would absolutely love to hear. He said to me, I'm going to take you to your very first New York Yankees baseball game. I was bouncing off the walls. I was so excited going to Yankee Stadium for the very first time ever for this nine-year-old was absolutely spectacular. So I got my glove, I got my Yankee hat. I happened to find my Yankee hat. So I put that Yankee hat on and I was very excited. As we were about to leave, my mother handed me 
a small brown paper bag and said, here's a chicken sandwich for you to take with you. So you shouldn't have to eat a lot of junk food at Yankee Stadium. And I didn't know. I took the chicken uh, sandwich in a bag and we, we took the bus from Marine Park all the way to the D train. And just about, we were about to get on the D train. My father says to me, give me the uh, chicken sandwich. I hand him the chicken sandwich and he throws it in the garbage. He said, the first lesson is when you go to Yankee Stadium, you don't wanna look like an idiot and eating a chicken sandwich. You eat hot dogs at Yankee Stadium. And he just throws out the sandwich. Anyway, we get on the train and he allows me to, to get in the first car of the first train where you could see all the train going down the tracks. And I thought that was absolutely spectacular. We met the conductor back then. They actually had conductors and the conductor was in a full uniform and he's telling me, he's showing me on the map where we're going. And then about maybe an hour and 20 minutes later from underground, we emerge with hundreds and hundreds of other people and I look in the distance and I see the Cathedral of Baseball, Yankee Stadium. <laughs> Not a stadium that's named after some corporation or named after a city, but it's actually named after the team that plays there every single day. We wait online, we get our tickets, and my dad was smart enough to get in there early to see batting practice. Just no, to see don't do that. The entire experience. So, we're on the ground floor. I can see the brown of the dirt, the blue of the sky, the green of the grass. And then up there, like as big as life, I'm staring at him as close as anything is number seven, the broad shoulders of my favorite player, Mickey Mantle. He is up there <laughs> he's hitting balls to left field, he's hitting balls to right field. This was absolutely spectacular. If a nine-year-old could have a baseball orgasm, I was having it right then and there. It was truly spectacular. Then my father said the, the stadium start to fill up. And then my dad said, look, the game is about to begin. Let's go to our seats. So I said, oh, we're not sitting here. He goes, no, 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 no. We have much better seats than these. We have the best seats in Yankee Stadium. So we go up the first level with the escalator. And I say, oh, are our seats here? He goes, no, no, no. We have seats much better than these. And we go up three or four more levels. We get up to the top. We walk about two thirds up to the second. And Mickey Mantle, who had been huge and big not more than eight minutes ago, is about this big in the outfield. And I can hardly see him. I'm looking go. These are the best seats. And my dad says very proudly, these are the best seats in Yankee Stadium. Do you want to sit down there with the poor people or you want to stay in the expensive seats? I said, oh, no, no, I want to stay in these seats. You, he, my dad said, you can see everything from here. And I'm thinking, oh, my dad knows because he's, he's been to hundreds of baseball games. He knows everything. So my dad hey, says, if you want to learn anything about baseball, just ask me and I will tell you. So. I order a hot dog and my dad yells out, hey, Mac, come over here. We need a hot dog. And he gives me a hot dog and he gives him 50 cents and I eat the hot dog. And I said, Dad, can I get a Coke? And he says, oh, Mac, come over here. Bring me a Coke. And another guy comes over and he gives me a Coke and I'm drinking this. And I'm thinking, this is great. You get food. Around the third inning, I said, Dad, can I get some, uh, you know, uh, Cracker Jack? He says, yeah. He says, hey, Mac, come over here. We need some Cracker Jack. And I said, Dad, all these guys, how do you know their names? It goes, oh, well, everybody who sells food at Yankee Stadium, one of the requirements is you have to have the name Mac. You can only work in Yankee Stadium. If your name is Mac, then you can get a job here. And I'm thinking, my dad is so brilliant. He knows everything about baseball. And I'm watching the game and they change uh, batters and they, the other team goes into the field. Then towards around the, the almost like the sixth or seventh inning, I'm getting stuffed. And my dad says to me, he goes, look, he says, remember that song that you learned in day camp, take me out to the ball game? And I said, yes. He says, well, I've arranged to have you lead everybody in singing, take me out to the ball game. And I, I'm having the announcer announce it. 
So I'm going, oh my God, this is incredible. And then I hear the announcer, please everyone, join us in Take Me Out to the Ball Game. And we all stand up and I start singing, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. And everybody is singing with me. And I'm thinking, I have the best dad in the world. He made these arrangements and this is just absolutely fantastic. And then around the eighth inning, the Yankees bring in a relief pitcher and he, he points out to the, the bullpen and he says, oh, you see all the way out there with the pitcher and catcher? He says, he goes, yeah. He says, that, that's, you know, out, I ask him, what is that? He says, oh, that's the minor league. It's a much smaller stadium and they don't allow any other players except the pitcher and the catcher. That's why it's called the minor league. So they'll bring in a player from the minor league to pitch the last two innings, you know, just to give him some practice. I'm going, boy, my dad's so smart. He knows everything. So around the ninth inning, I said, dad, can I get some ice cream? And he yells out, hey, buddy, bring over some ice cream. And I said, dad, I thought you said everybody here is named Mac. He says, oh, well, Mac got sick. So his brother, Buddy, took his place for the day. So that's why he's here for the day. And I'm thinking, boy, my dad knows everything about baseball. So at the end of the game, I am stuffed. We end up at maybe 10 or 11 o'clock at night getting on the train, going back home. And my father says to me, he says, look, mom is going to ask you about the chicken sandwich. So when he asks you, when she asks you, how do you like the chicken sandwich? I want you to rub your belly and say, mm, I love that chicken sandwich, mom. So we get home. My mom is waiting on the porch and I'm telling her about the game. I'm telling her about all these guys named Mac who brought us food. I'm telling about Mac's brother, Buddy, who brought us ice cream. I'm telling about how dad just had everybody leave, I let everybody and take me out to the ball game. I tell her about the minor leagues and she's just shaking head. Then finally the money question comes. And she says to me, she looks at me and says, so how did you like the chicken sandwich? And I look at my dad and I'm checking and I go, hmm, I love the chicken sandwich. And my mom nods and then she said, well, how many hot dogs did you have? And I said, four. And my dad got in trouble. So that was the story of my first Yankee game. I hope you enjoyed that little, that little story. So the first thing, in addition to what Noreen was talking about, about the value of laughter, there's three parts in the value of laughter that I think is extraordinarily important. Number one, you have to maintain the ability to laugh at yourself. Laughing at yourself is an extraordinarily powerful way to keep your sense of judgment, to keep yourself stress-free. And a lot of people ask me, well, how do you start the day laughing at yourself? Well, here's a little hint, starting the day laughing at yourself. Get up early in the morning, take off all of your clothes, just all of your clothes <laughs> and go into the bathroom, okay? Look at yourself in the mirror, turn around a couple of times, get a good look. And if you hear laughter that's not yours, close your bathroom window, and then start laughing, okay? Because you don't want anybody else looking at you when that's happening. <laughs> Very important to be able to laugh at yourself. And when I think about uh, people who are in law or in politics who are able to laugh at themselves, I would think of two people who were able to do this extraordinarily well. One was Ronald Reagan, and the other one was John F. Kennedy, two sides of the aisle here. So Ronald Reagan... Um, if you remember, 1984, he was running for re-election for president, and he was in a debate with Walter Mondale. And at that time, he was 73 years old, and his age was uh, a question. You know, can a man who's 73 years old actually be the president? It's amazing when we think about that today, because Joe Biden's seven. But back then, it was a big question with Ronald Reagan. So a reporter during the debate uh, asks him the question. He says, uh, you know, uh, Mr. President, um, do you think that age should be an issue in this race? So Reagan, you know, takes the question and he says, well, I will tell you, I will not make the youth and inexperience of my opponent an issue in this race at all. And he got a big laugh and the, the issue of age just went away. Why? Because he was able to laugh at himself. If you can make yourself the butt of a joke, puts you in a very powerful place. Same thing on the other side of the aisle with John F. Kennedy. He had just won the election 
And there was some question about whether his father, who was a multimillionaire at hundreds of millions of millions of dollars, had actually bought him the election. So a reporter during one of the press conferences says, uh, Senator Kennedy, at this point, he's still the senator, but he's president elect, says, Senator Kennedy, do you think your father bought you this election? And Senator Kennedy looks back and says, well, you know, I was talking to my dad about that before the election. And he said to me, John, I'm certainly going to uh, donate to your election, but I got to tell you, I'm not paying for a landslide. And that got a big laugh in the room and that issue went away. Why? Why did those issues go away? Because they were able to laugh at themselves. So that's a, the first rule that's extremely important. Second rule that's very important to take in is being, being able to share your sense of humor with others. And I don't just mean joke. Jokes are very good to tell each other, that's fine. But I think it's even more important than telling jokes is sharing stories that you find make you laugh, that make you more human and make you connect with other people. Like the story that I just told about my dad and my first baseball game. I enjoy telling that story because it brings back memories of my dad. It makes people laugh. I enjoy telling that story. And you should tell stories about your family, about your work. And I'll tell you another uh, brief story. I don't know if anybody out there can do this. Can anybody touch their tongue to their nose? Can okay. anybody else do that? I don't know if anybody of you can do that. Well, I can <laughs> do that. My, my dad can do that. So. 1948, my parents got married, and my Uncle Charlie was there, my grandmother Esther, my father's brother Sammy, my Aunt Rose. They could all tuck their tongues to their nose also. So my father spontaneously got all of them together, all of them together and gave the uh, photographer an extra dollar to take a picture of all of them touching their tongues to their nose. Now this picture, all of them, there's like four or five brothers, one cousin, all standing there like this in their tuxedos and their gowns. That picture is actually in my parents' album of all of these people touching their tongues to their nose. That became a regular Novik family gathering. Anytime there was a bar mitzvah, there was a wedding, there was a party, they would all get together. Anybody who could touch their tongues to their nose would all do that. Um, so, in uh, 1963, my brother Paul was getting bar mitzvahed in about a month, and I really, really, really wanted to be in the Novik tongue touching the nose picture at that bar mitzvah, but I could not yet touch my tongue to my nose. So I asked my father, how can I be in the picture? He says, well, I'll give you the secret. Here's the secret. What you have to do is get up every day and brush your teeth clean your teeth really, really well with your toothbrush, and then your tongue will just be able to stretch up and touch your tongue to your nose. So I said, oh, that's, the says, that's the secret. So every day, two or three times a day, I would brush my teeth. And of course, my father was just trying to get me to brush my teeth every day. And I would stand in front of the mirror as a little kid, and I would go, mm, 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 trying to touch my tongue to my nose. Then one day, one Saturday morning, about a week before the bar mitzvah, I'm brushing my teeth and I'm just so disappointed because I've still not been able to touch my tongue to my nose. I finished brushing my teeth. I clean out my mouth with water and I try it yet again in front of the mirror and my tongue touches my nose. I can't <laughs> it finally worked. I go running up to my dad. I said, look, I touched my tongue to my nose. Mm. And my father goes, holy crap, I can't believe that worked. That's amazing. And I run into my brother's bedroom who was practicing his haftorah. And I look at him as a younger brother, you know, should. I look at him and go, mm -hmm. I'm going to be in the tongue touching the nose picture. You can. Mm -hmm. Just then with my nose touching my, with my tongue touching my nose, my brother takes his fist and he hits the bottom of my chin and I bite my tongue. <sighs> and the pain oh, was horrific. Uh, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about there was blood. There was, I mean, just saliva. There was tears. There was, I mean, it was, I was in such pain. My tongue had blown up. I was crying. I was screaming. I'm running up and down the stairs in pain. The dog is barking and I'm yelling things like, I peeped into my tongue with it. I peeped into my tongue with it. 
the only thing I was worried about is I could no longer touch my tongue to my nose. Of course, that was a horrible <laughs> thing. So I said, my father sat me down and I said, uh, Did why do you have to do that? Get with me. He says, you know, you, you know, let me tell you, your brother is just jealous of you because he has that small nose from your mother's side of the family. <laughs> I don't even know. I got to tell you, I don't even know how he breathes through that thing. You know, like me and you and grandpa and Uncle Harry and Uncle Sammy, we all have the big Novik nose. And when we sneeze, we sneeze out all the germs. He's all, always getting sick all the time. And of course, my dad gets me laughing. And at the bar mitzvah, at the bar mitzvah, there I was very proudly with my cousin Melvin, my uncle Charlie at nine years old touching my tongue to my nose very proudly. Now, that's a story about my family. That's a little silly, but I'm sure that all of you in your family have some story about your family that makes your entire family laugh. And when you look back at it, you can't help but laugh as you get older. The thing is, you must share those stories with each other, share them with your family, share them with your kids, because it's what really binds us. It creates a bond between us that is that lasts a lifetime. And the most important thing, the last part of this, is write your stories down. Write them down because in 100 years, in 50 years, in 75 years, there is no better source for keeping generations of people who are long gone in your heart and in your family, but sharing those stories with generation after generation after generation. Uh, when my dad turned 75, we were trying to figure out what to give him as a gift. So we decided that my girlfriend, Rosie and I, and my brother, Paul, and a few other cousins, we decided to write down all of the stories in our lifetime that we could think of. I wrote down the story of my first baseball game. I wrote down the story of my dad teaching me how to play ping pong. I wrote down the story about uh, touching your tongue to your nose. It was probably about maybe 15 or 20 really good stories. And the good thing about a story is those of you who are married or have a partner in life is that when you tell a story, your spouse or your significant other will always look at you and say, no, that's not how it happened. And they'll tell their version. So we got a lot of different stories with different versions that was um, that were shared in this book. And my father looks at this book and he's reading all the stories and about a third of the book we left blank. And he says, oh, you didn't have enough stories to fill the book. And I said, dad, you're living in Florida. You probably have other stories that you can share and write in the book on your own. So my father would write down stories. Then my mother would look at it and say, that's not what happened. Then she would write her version of the story. And for the rest of their lives, when I whenever I visited my parents, the, one of the first things I would do is read all of these new stories. So all of the stories of my parents living in Florida, I think um, when we finally lost my dad, uh, and I have these books, uh, by the way, in my uh bookcase now we have about two and a half books of stories in that are so wonderful to read and so he actually took this upon himself to share more stories so those are the three humor skills that i want to make sure that you understand number one being able to tell stories uh, yourself number two sharing those stories with others number three writing the stories down so you have a book of family stories that is unique to you. You can read the same book as other people. You can pick up the same novel and read it and say, hey, I just read this novel by John Grisham. No one has the same stories you do. The stories of your family that make you laugh in your family are as unique as your own family. So those are my humor skills. Now, one of the things that I did and learning about humor skills and taking improv was the fact that I, as an improviser, I trained at Second City. Second City is the same uh, place that uh, taught people like John Belushi and um, uh, Tina Fey and uh, 
Gilda Radner and uh, Horatio Sands. All of these people learned improvisational skills, either at Second City or the Upright Citizens Brigade. I discovered very early on that the skills that you need to be an outstanding attorney and the skills of improvisers really do parallel very well. Very, how many, I don't know how many of you are trial attorneys, but certainly for trial attorneys, you have to remember your jury is your audience. I mean, think about that. And you as a storyteller, and if you can tell the story in a way that really grabs people, uh, you know, people do not think in terms in a trial of fact, fact, fact. They think in terms of just the hero or the person who they empathize with. So a couple of, a uh, series of skills are very important to learn from improv to uh, becoming a, an attorney. One of the first things you learn in improvisation as an improvisational lawyer is communication skills. This ability to tell a story, this ability to tell a story from beginning to middle and end that reaches people in their own experience is an extraordinarily, extraordinarily important skill to have. It's one of the skills that you definitely pick up in improvisation. Another skill in improvisation is being able to work with other people on stage. They tend to make you look good. You tend to make them look good. And in a, a successful improvisation on stage, it's where each partner is taking care of the other. Same thing when you're working with someone on a case, when you're collaborating with a client, if you're collaborating with another attorney, it's very important that you look at each person, even an opposing attorney, believe it or not, because what an opposing attorney does or when a judge makes a, a, a bad ruling, what you have to be able to do is uh, bounce back from that and stay in the moment. That's another very important skill from improvisation. Now, I don't know if anybody has any, if anybody has any questions, certainly uh, raise your hand and I will uh, certainly take your question. Another thing that improvisation does that's extraordinarily important is this entire, you may have heard of this, is this entire structure of what's called yes and. In a scene, what you're doing is you're always agreeing with the other person by saying yes and, and adding information that kind of builds. Now this orientation towards agreement especially works very successfully in mediation. I have a very large portion of my practice as an attorney in entertainment law is mediation. Is, uh, mediation. And when in a mediation, if you can build an, an environment of agreement and trust, you can find out what the two parties want. And you know the old uh, example they give, uh, let's say you have two people and you have a, a, an orange that you must split between the two of them. Some people say, well, um, you know, all you have to do is take a knife, cut the orange in half, and both people will get uh, part of the orange. But you know, what you really have to do is listen very effectively to what each party wants because one party may want the juice of the orange, the other party may want to uh, you know, bake a, uh, a pie and need the, uh, uh, the um, I forgot what they're called when you, you, when you uh, scrape the, the part of it off. Zest. Oh yes, the zest to um, create a pie or you know, <clears throat> a cake. So you really have to listen. That's another thing that um, improvisation gives you very successfully is the ability to have active listening. Uh, I'm going to put all of these things in the um, chat here. Just one second. I'm going to share this in, in a chat. Let me see if I can. Nope, I guess that's not working. Hold on one second. Let me see if I can copy this. Uh, let me go to everybody. Okay. If you're trying to cut and paste. Yeah, there I did. Okay. okay. So these are, these are the areas that I find improvisation works very well. We've already talked about the first one of communication, collaboration, building trust, very important. The ability to actively listen and engage with people. 
so that there is that yes and trust building. So you hear what they're saying, you have an understanding on not only on an intellectual or academic level, but also on an emotional level. If you remember, Plato talked about three very important ways of being able to persuade people. Uh, one was logos, the logical argument. That's what we tend to learn in law school. Another very important one is ethos, which is your credibility. That's your word. A third one that's extremely important that he talked about is pathos, the emotional, to be able to connect with people. And when I say emotional, I don't mean that we, we're getting all emotional. What I'm talking about is connecting people with each other on a people person to person level. It's extremely important. Another very important skill is agility. I, I mentioned this a few minutes ago briefly. The ability to bounce back and be flexible in a trial is extremely important. The ability to almost stand there like a ninja warrior and be ready for anything around you is another very important skill that you pick up from being a good improviser. Um, the next one talked a little bit about is authenticity. Being real in the moment, being honest with both your client, yourself, uh, your jury. You know how kids have really good uh, bull crap meters? You know, when you're trying to almost fool a kid, sometimes they can tell immediately, right? I mean, you have to be aware of that with the jury. You have to be aware of that with clients. You have to be aware of that and be authentic. Tell the truth, have credibility. Oh, and that's a lot of that comes from being in the moment of, of an improvisation. Um, the last one is resilience. This ability to come back time after time when you've fallen down, being able to get up. All of those skills are very important uh, for, for, for attorneys and uh, improvisers. Um, I have been teaching, I actually started out not as an attorney. I went to law school at the age of 47. I don't know how many of you went to Seton Hall. Any of you go to Seton Hall? We're up on the screen. Nope, anybody? It's yeah, there are some hands. Well, there are a couple of hands there. I was, uh, I went to Seton Hall Law School. I see a few of you, great, excellent. Um, I went to law school. I decided to go back to school. Um, when I was a, um, in college, I applied for law school and I was accepted into a law school at the age of 22 out in California. I wanted to put as many miles between Pearl and Bernie Novick and myself as I possibly could. And I accepted a, and I gave my uh, $1,000 first seat, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, deposit. And then I started that, I started doing stand-up comedy. <laughs> I was hanging out at clubs and trying to do stand-up comedy in New York City. And I decided one day that I was not gonna go to law school that I wanted to do stand-up comedy. So I sent a little note in, you had to send a note, they would give you one year to put off going, coming into school. So I put it off for a year, I sent that in, I called, I made sure that they got it, and I got a letter certifying that I was gonna be al allowed to come in next year. Then I called my parents, okay? <laughs> then I called my mother. So, I called my mother, I got her on the phone, and I said, Mom, I've decided to put off going to law school until next year. And my mother was screaming at me on the phone. She was yelling at me, how could you do this? How could, because, and then she said to me something I'll never forget. She said, what are we gonna tell your Aunt Lila? My Aunt Lila, <laughs> my Aunt Lila was the woman that my mother would always call and go, oh, my son Joey just got a hundred on a math test. Oh, my son, you know, she was the aunt that we would brag to. And she was afraid that my Aunt Lila would think, oh, he didn't even make law school. Like my mother would be embarrassed. And then I said, look, mom, I've already made the decision. I already, uh, I already called the school. I've already put it off for a year. And my mother says, well, I'm going to call them back. My mother actually called them back to try to talk them out of it. Says my son didn't. My son didn't know what he was doing. He made a mistake, and I couldn't believe that she called. But I put off what I thought was for a year. But I continued to do stand-up comedy for like the next twenty years. And at about the age of forty-six, forty-seven, um, I decided I started getting interested again in in law from having been an elected official. 
So I uh, went back, I took the LSAT, I did very well in the LSAT, and I applied to Seton Hall School of Law, and I was accepted there at the age of 47. So I entered school, and uh, I'll end off with another story with regard to my parents. Um, uh, Seton Hall was extremely kind in um, giving me uh, somewhat of a scholarship. And for those of you who went to Seton Hall School of Law, you know that it's a Catholic affiliated school. So as a joke, I called my mother. I said, Mom, I just uh, want to tell you something very exciting. You know that I was accepted to um, Seton Hall School of Law, but and they gave me a scholarship of like about $38,000 to cover part of the tuition. She said, oh, that's wonderful. I said, oh, mom, but there's one catch. I have to sign an agreement that I accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior. And my mother starts screaming, no, you're not going to sign that. Don't sign that. We'll do it. And she starts screaming upstairs, Bernie, Bernie, get on the phone, get on the phone. <laughs> and my dad gets on the phone and she says, she goes, tell your father what you just told me. So I said, dad, I have very excited news. <laughs> I received a um, scholarship to Seton Hall School of Law, but the only stipulation is I have to sign it. I have to sign an agreement that you know, even though I'm Jewish, I have to sign an agreement that I accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior. <laughs> my father is silent, completely quiet, and then he says, "Well." look, we know you're Jewish, you know you're Jewish, sign it, take the money. And my mother's going, you're not going to take the money. We're going to get a second mortgage on the house. My father says, we can't afford that. You're not going to take the money. And I'm trying to get mom, dad, I'm just kidding. And they hung up the phone. And I had a call back and they were screaming at each other. And I finally had to say to them, look, it's just kidding. I don't have to sign that. And my mother said, you, you shouldn't do that to us. That's not funny. That wasn't <laughs> funny at all. My father said, boy, you really got us. That's a good joke that you played on us. So those were my parents. So I just want to end off by saying, uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, presentation a bit. I hope you learned a bit and laughed a bit. But just to review, uh, the skills, the humor skills that you need are certainly to be able to share those stories um, that make that make you the butt of the joke that make you laugh number two share those stories with others and certainly write them down extremely important skills to have as an attorney as a human being to keep your stress and keep you know your legal skills and your storytelling skills very fresh so i hope you enjoyed that thank you so much if anybody has any questions i'll certainly um answer if anybody just raise your hand and i'll answer any questions anybody might have um, Joey, if you could just uh, let everyone know how they can get in touch with you, if you want to type your website or something oh, into the chat, and uh, uh, the so they can learn more about the yeah. improv classes sure. and uh, information. The best way to get in touch with me is to call my parents. No, I'm just <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, what I'll do is I will, uh, in the chat, I will put in my um, uh, website address and my email address. I'm doing that right now. And I'm so going to relaunch our one question poll for people who came in later. Um, we just want to know before you came to today's presentation, when was the last time you laughed? And everyone can also answer this all over again because it's going to start from zero. Oh, I think I'm only, I only did it to one person. I'm going to put it in for everybody. Hold on. And I just want to let everyone know, I'm going to put the website of the New Jersey Lawyers Assistance Program into chat. And if you go there and click on the yellow highlighted link at the top of our page, you'll be taken to a quick info page, which will show you all our uh, presentations, a link to our YouTube page. We're trying very hard to get 100 subscribers so we can have our own uh, name on that page 
And uh, of course, our email and phone uh, for anybody who needs to call us for any reason whatsoever. And um, I'd like to thank I'm Joey. Good. And what I did is I just uh, put in my, uh, all the way at the end, there's my, um, uh, my um, web address, improvforlawyers.com, and also my email address, uh, joeynovig at gmail.com, in case you have any questions or would like to be in contact with me. So does anyone have any questions for Joey before we let him go? Let's give him a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, if any of you, I also will give you the phone number of my Aunt Lila, <laughs> so you can call her and tell her what a wonderful uh, presentation uh, this is. So I'd appreciate that just to let her know also. That would be good. Okay. It's important. It's important. Thank you again, yes. Joey. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you all for coming today. I hope this was a good wrap up to uh, Wellbeing in Law Week for you and that you all have a great weekend and happy Mother's Day to all the moms, grandmoms happy and Mother's Day. great grandmoms and mothers to be and mothers in spirit and uh, take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Noreen. Thank you, thank you Vincent. Noreen, thank you so much. This was a great deal of fun. You're welcome, Joey. Next year. I uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. I love seeing some of the faces. I'm glad some people uh, joined in. And um, let me see what they look like. I think that was great. You all have such great headshots also. I think there are some people who have such great headshots. See, this is my headshot. I'll show you. This is the headshot. Oh, that nice. I, that's my headshot. You can see uh, I, it's, it's me. It's still me who looks, uh, looks like that. All right. Any other questions? No, great. All right, Noreen, anything you need, certainly give me an email and I'll uh, be in touch. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. You too. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.